we all have them at one time or the other. <laughs> a friend of mine named Buddy Conrad, he was a big Elvis fan from back as far as 1955. I told Buddy I'd let him know when Elvis was going to be in town. And so, um, but Buddy brought his motorcycle, had one just like Elvis, over to where, where we were. And uh, Elvis just had a conniption fit because he had a motorcycle at his disposal here on his vacation. Elvis loved to ride motorcycles, and there again, that stemmed from the fact that he couldn't really afford a big Harley when he was young. He th uh, the Harley Davidson with the big bikes when we were all teenagers and all, we would all marvel at, whoa, gee, look at that bike, wow, oh, what a Harley, that was the big deal. Well, it, when, when he became famous and, and, and wealthy enough to, to, to afford those bikes, he went out and bought them and loved to ride them. He really liked it. Uh, the movie studios didn't like it too much. When Elvis first moved up to Memphis from Tupelo, we were in the exact same class. I remember the first time we actually met in the in eighth grade music class. He brought his guitar to class at Christmas time, got up and sang a couple of songs, and I was amazed. So for a guy to bring a, a guitar to school, a 12 year old guy, and sing, that was a big deal. I was president of the senior class, editor of the yearbook and all, but when we got out of high school, I became a disc jockey and a TV performer in Memphis and um, tried to help, us along, help Elvis along with his career. In high school, Elvis was kind of a shy guy, sort of a laid-back, quiet guy, unassuming, but he stood out in his own way. He would let his, his hair was longer than anybody's hair in the school, and he had a, some, a little bit of a, a sideburn on there, so that made him different. But he would, the thing that really made Elvis stand out in high school was the way he dressed. Everybody was wearing uh, maybe a t-shirt and uh, a pair of blue jeans or what have you, and Elvis would come to school with a pair of dress pants on with maybe a black pair of pants with a pink stripe down the side and uh, a sport coat with a maybe trimmed in white with a collar turned up. You could miss him. As he would take people through Graceland, he would take you through his trophy room and he'd say, now that's my high school picture there. He said, but if you look at the very top, there's George. He was president of the class. He was one of the few guys that was nice to me in high school. They weren't, they, they weren't really rude to him, but they kidded him. Some of the guys, some of the guys on, on the sports teams or, or of that nature would give him a hard time about the way he wore his hair and the way he dressed. And you know the famous story, they were going to cut his hair in the, in the men's room and uh, some of the uh, guys from the football team had some scissors and Red West was there and Red intruded and said, if you're going to mess with him, you're going to go through me. And Red was a pretty tough guy, so they backed off. And Elvis never actually, at truth be known, never forgot all of that. When I first met him, he was, as you could say, really and truly a young boy. When, when I was in my little office and Elvis and his cousin Jean would come visiting, and they would be there half of the time and Elvis would be combing his hair. The, the most poignant memory I have is that they were sitting underneath the house, they told me, Jean and, and Elvis. And they were so poor, they didn't have any toys, but somehow they managed to have a tiny little toy car. And they would play with the toy car in the sand. And so then when he became so involved with cars and Cadillacs and everything, I think it must have been that he remembered what it was like when he was so young, you know, and so poor. He was a car fanatic. Uh, he once said he couldn't drive by a showroom or, with, or a car lot without stopping and looking. And, and that all stemmed from the fact that when we were very young, we couldn't afford nice cars. And he, many times he would tell me that you're sitting on a curb and or he would sit and stand on the corner and watch all the beautiful cars go by and say, one of these days I'm going to own that big car, I'm going to have that beautiful automobile. Uh, I can afford things I never would have gotten otherwise. And if I hadn't gotten lucky in life, you know. I said if I ever had any money, I was going to get my fill of cars. The pink Cadillac actually was black, I think, when they first bought it. And Elvis, uh, at, 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 in, the, in the 50s, in the late, the mid to late 50s, pink and black were big colors. Guys would wear pink shirts with a black tie. It was fashionable. So Elvis uh, thought it would be really wild to have a pink uh, Cadillac. So he had it painted pink, and because of who he was, he could get away with that. Elvis spent quite a bit of time at June's mother's house there, you know. When he wasn't over at Gulf Hills, he'd be there, usually. Well, whenever he came there, everybody in Biloxi knew it, it seemed like. And people called and called on the phone. Well, I remember him coming here one day, and um, a lady called on the phone. And she had a little girl that had leukemia. 
And the little girl was crazy about Elvis, as small as she was. And she called me up and she said, uh, Miss May, is uh, Elvis there? And I said, he sure is. She said, well, I wonder if I came up there, would he spend a little time with Carol? And I, I asked him and he said, sure, come, tell her to come on up. So they came up and they came on in the house and met Elvis. The child brought up the subject of Hound Dog and that was her favorite song and she loved the part where the hound dog wasn't paying attention and that Elvis took the dog by the face and turned it, you know, and the little girl was real shy and, uh, and, and she wouldn't look at Elvis when she was talking to him and he would take her and turn her face up to his to, um, to hear what she was saying. And it wasn't but about maybe a month or so that she had passed away. But she had got her wish to, you know, to be with Elvis. He was a fine person, really. Uh, I don't know of anybody that was any nicer than Elvis because he, he was just a, a, a great guy. He treated me like I was something special, you know. He was very, very nice to work with. He had a serious side to his nature. I think he took his art seriously but he didn't take himself seriously. I remember when uh, one, one day I, he was getting ready for, for a recording session and uh, I said to him, lots of luck Elvis. And Elvis says, I'll need it, I'll need it. So I said, oh, well, you, you, listen, you're the biggest thing in the world. He says, tomorrow I may not be worth a, a nickel. I asked him one night what kind of uh, feeling did he get when he walked out on that stage. He, he couldn't understand it, for one thing. Well, you've seen film footage of some of his concerts. It was just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. And the amount of uh, the size of the crowds, I mean, they were just were tearing at one another to get to touch him. It was wonderful just to get to touch him. Uh, he later on described it to me as better than an orgasm, the chills. It was out front, in front of the stage, where all the chaos was. Elvis would create it by his movements on stage and his interplay with the audience and all. And the famous one was in Vancouver, Canada, where uh, Elvis was performing outside on a football stadium, 100,000 people there, and there was nobody on the field. And Elvis comes out on stage and says, well, come on down. And they all emptied on the field, 100,000 people, charged the stage, had to stop the show. Finally, Colonel Parker said, Elvis, we got to get out of here. This is getting dangerous. So Elvis jumped in a police car and took off. And Scotty and DJ and Bill, we jumped in his limousine. Well, the fans charged the stage, turned the stage over, de completely demolished it. Took all the wood parts of the stage for souvenirs, took all the sheet music, took the music stands, took what instruments were left as souvenirs. And then they came to the car where we were. They thought Elvis was in the limousine, but he wasn't. He'd already got away. And uh, they were looking in there and they, they said, well, Elvis, and we said, he's not in here. He's not, we're hollering through the window because we had the windows rolled up. And so, so they took knives and they went down the side of the car to scrape off paint for souvenirs. They pulled the license plates off. They broke the air.